side sweet. Ani mi kashia tsmi basi ta limu da zet. Le kula tsari kina mitim shi badoni mi kula tsari kina mitim shi kina far. Ukdo shi mara tsima be kula tsari mi kula tsari kina mitim shi kina far. Ukdo shi mara tsima be kula tsari mi kula tsari kina mitim shi kina far. Ukdo shi mara tsima be kula tsari mi kula tsari kina mitim shi kina far. Ukdo shi mara tsima be kula tsari mi kula tsari kina mitim shi kina far. Ukdo shi mara tsima be kula tsari mi kula tsari kina mitim shi kina far. Ukdo shi mara tsima be kula tsari mi kula tsari kina mitim shi kina far. Ukdo shi mara tsima be kula tsari mi kula tsari kina mitim shi kina far. Ukdo shi mara this class will be in the merit and in the honor and also for the Yad Neshama of Roz Shoshana Bat Nabel. And if anyone else has a name of someone that they want to add for the Gui of Neshama, Neshama. Klaoi Bat Simcha, Nashib Ben Rachel Musod. And for all the people that have either passed away this year that need Aliyot with their Neshama Bezat Hashem, may their Neshama be risen up and, and they should reach their their resting place in Gan Eden, Amen. Amen. For the people that need a refua, Shmuel ben Sarah. Shmuel ben? Sarah. Sarah. Yadan ben? Yadan ben? Oli. Oli. And Rachel Chana Yacha, Pati Tor Miriam, Miriam Oram, Soda. And all the sick people of Am Yisrael, Emna Rafana Lahem, Emna Rafana Lahem. Hashem grant them a very quick and speedy and healthy recovery. Amen. Mm -hmm. So tonight's class, uh, for better or for worse, literally had very, very little preparation. Um, and unfortunately, uh, a couple of events kind of came up. But funny enough, as I was leaving my house to come here to give the class, I realized that uh, it was actually directly related to the things that we were learning in the actual lesson in Nikutei Maran. So we're currently going through lesson six for some people that are new here. And lesson six is the lesson on Tshuva. Now Rabbi Nachman says that the process of the lesson six that discusses Tshuva, it starts off by talking about honor. It's the honor of a person that in order to gain the honor of God, you need to reduce your own honor. And he talks about two different types of honor, the honor of kings and the honor of man. And so or the honor of kings and the honor of God, essentially. But the person can attain the godly honor by reducing his own honor. And part of that process is going through tshuva to be able to attain that honor. And we had a couple classes discussing all of that. Now, funny enough, we got to a point where we left off, which was the discussion on waiting and being able to get to a place where you understand sometimes that you're being tested or you're in a place where you haven't yet gone to exist. Because as you begin to do tshuva, tshuva is the concept of the future. And because you haven't yet done your tshuva, you're now starting to be reborn. There's a concept of hitrachut. It's almost a renewing process. And since you haven't yet existed, now you're going to start from that place to start to reveal the oneness of God's name, which is the highest level of God's name, which is the name of Ekyed. It's the name of God of the Aleph, He, Yud, and He. And this is the name of God that's used specifically because it's the futuristic name. It's the name of God that Hashem used whenever He took the Jews out of Egypt. It's the same God that whenever Moshe said, what name should I say to Bnei Yisrael when he was by the burning bush and he said, Ekiya Asher that's the name that he used. And so it's a reference specifically to that. And what was remarkable is that I was walking back with Michael um, to my house after, um, after lunch this afternoon and after Musaf at Shul. And on my way back home with a couple of my friends, we realized that, and also with Tabi Moshe, that my mom and my sister were meeting me halfway down the block because someone had broken into my room and stolen my wallet and like some clothing from my room as they were walking out and it was just chaotic and and I was just like okay kapara you know like it, it is what it is and they were like and they had taken my notes which have also my papers inside my wallet what, other than my credit cards and all that stuff but which has like all the refua shlema and all those types of things. So I just I, I don't have my list with me tonight. That's why I have such a short list. And um, after Shabbat, the reason why I didn't get to prepare is because I usually prepare after Shabbat for the hour and a half. But I was just taking care of dealing with the credit card fraud and like all the stuff with the company. So it was just kind of funny how all that happened. And remarkably, I was telling my mom and my sister after Shabbat that when it happened to me during Shabbat, I was completely at peace with it. Like, it didn't bother me at all. Like, when it happened, they came and told me I was, I was completely cool with it. I was just like, okay, Kapala, like, this is good. Like, this is, thank God, like, whatever it was meant to do is taking care of something that's, that's fine. I was like, there's so many worse things that could have happened. This is the way that Hashem's deciding to take care of this. So I was like, that's fantastic, thank God. And when Shabbat exited, my way of handling the situation changed. And it was kind of remarkable how I told my mom, I'm like, I'm being very sensitive to this, but 
when I was in the Shabbat, I was completely at peace with it. But when I exited the Shabbat, dealing with the credit card company, just like everything that was just like, everything that was normal that should have just been very easy like they were able to cancel all my cards except for one specific card but for one reason they couldn't find that card in their system but that was the card that there was fraud happening on it mm. so i was just like it just kept on building up and i kept on trying to prepare so like i'm on customer service with chase and amex on one line and i'm trying to like think of ideas to write and i couldn't think of anything and i was just having this block it was just this massive block that i just couldn't get what was going on and then right as i was hanging up with the second credit card company I was, I was dealing with Chase and then Chase Business and then Amex, I finally realized like as I was wrapping up and I was like, all right, I have to be there in 10 minutes to give the class. I realized that I actually wanted to discuss something from part of last class and part of what I would eventually be getting to in this actual class for tonight, which I didn't really get to prepare for. And so in order to explain this, I heard a beautiful mashal, a beautiful um, allegory or, or a story that kind of relates um, in symbolism to the idea that I want to discuss here. And I heard it from a rabbi or I guess a chassid, a breast of chassid in Canada on a, on a breast of account called Breast of Thornhill. And he was giving a beautiful example that he had heard and then he had changed himself, but I thought it was incredibly relevant. So I want to share with you part of what I heard because I didn't even hear all of it, but I only heard part of it. And aside from the fact that it was in relation to lesson six, it was also relevant to my life. And then I myself took it even more through relevance into part of the things that we want to discuss and into my own concept. So what he was sharing that was actually phenomenal and remarkable is this idea in the story that there was this boy in a community and um, it's a fictional story. And the boy in the community had difficulty growing up in the religious community that he decided to separate himself from the other people and, and started going, as some people would say, off the derech. For Breslover, off the derech is not a big deal because off the derech is your derech because you'll eventually, that is the derech that you decide to really go on. So it's just about finding your way, finding Hashem in whatever path that is. So off the derech is just word for saying essentially that they just don't recognize Hashem. That's the true decline of being off the derech. It's just about not being able to recognize that Hashem's actually in your life this whole time. So it's not really the lack of the Torah and the mitzvot because Lots of people don't get to do Torah and Mitzvot. It's kind of funny how we think that some people are more religious than others based on their spiritual level or based on the actions that they do or how much Torah they learn or how many Mitzvot they do. But just because someone's born into a family that's not religious or doesn't keep kosher doesn't necessarily mean that that person is not a holy Jew. And furthermore, it's not even to say that they might not even be on a higher spiritual level because of their neshama that might have already repaired many different things before and all it needs to do is one specific mitzvah in this world and then it's done with its tikkun as opposed to maybe some person that might be living 90 years in this world to just to try to repair one small thing so it's phenomenal how our lack of perspective and that's kind of what i want to get into tonight um, changes the way we look at things and the way that things actually do actually matter in this world and so to kind of start the parable he says that there's this boy that was kind of going off the beaten path right not doing Judaism the way that other people prescribe it and a man a father from the community that was friends with his father told the man welcome <laughs> no it's cool don't worry about it we literally just started yeah we started late um, so the father that was a, fr a family friend of the, the father from the community told him you know don't worry about your son let me give him a job keep him busy and while he's busy with me I'll have I'll give him the opportunity to be able to learn Torah and kind of bring it back and as the boy started working with this man he started giving him a job and then he the boy realized through some of his mischievous actions and through him not really being connected to God and doing good things that he had opportunities to be able to steal from this man so as some opportunities came up he started taking a little bit of money here and a little bit of money there and eventually the man started to realize after a certain amount of time that through the cameras and also through realizing his receipts that money was being taken. He eventually realized that this boy was the one that was doing it. And he pulled him into his office and he told him, look, here's the cameras. Here's the proof. This is what's happening. And the boy was incredibly embarrassed for what had happened. But the man nonetheless said, you know, I don't want to report you, but I want to give you the opportunity to be able to fix what you did. So the man didn't tell on him and didn't do anything to degrade him, but he gave him the opportunity to continue to come back. And the boy slowly started working to try to repay the man. Eventually, as the way he explains the story, the man eventually started allowing him to be able to make more money 
and eventually give him gifts even though he didn't deserve it, even though the man himself didn't have money to be able to pay for his own family, but all he did was try to support this person. And then eventually this person realized that as he got older himself and had children and, and, and grew up to become an adult, he realized how much that this person had sacrificed for him so that he could live a life and be able to repair what he had stolen. And he realized that his tshuva, essentially, was through many different degrees. It was a tshuva on a tshuva. And so lesson six discusses the concept of a tshuva on a tshuva. And the reason why Rabbi Nachman is so big on tshuva in general, and we discussed this last time, is because tshuva is a process that's constantly evolving. It's a process that as you start to develop your relationship with, relationship with God, and as you continue to create space for God, you have to constantly minimize yourself. And as you minimize yourself, you realize that the way that you had originally minimized yourself, or you thought that you were creating space for God, you were actually not really creating space for God. But as you grew in Torah and Mitzvot, you now realize that you actually weren't giving God enough space, but now you're gonna give Him even more space. And then you continue to grow and you continue to give him even more space after that. The reason why I bring this up is because I just had jotted down some notes that I thought that this was incredibly relevant to my story with the wallet, right? That was, that was stolen today. And the reason why it's relevant indirectly is because this boy, right? And I'll actually, I'll start off with the wallet that makes more relevance and I'll segue into a different concept in Breast of Chassidut, and it's just a general concept in Chassidut in general, is that the reason why we don't judge, kind of how I brought up that point earlier, is because we don't know and we can't put ourselves in the shoes of other people. Now to give a little more background to that story earlier today, is when this man walked out of my back room and one of my sisters uh, saw him walking and just didn't understand who this person was, um, he was holding sweatpants in his hand that he had taken from my room, because he probably wanted pants. And my, after they told my dad, my dad rushed out and told him, I'll give you a pair of sweatpants, give those ones back if you're too cold and you don't have anything to keep yourself warm. So while my dad was going to give him a pair of sweatpants and trade him, and he was gonna give him shoes and my mom was preparing him a plate of food to eat, when my dad had gone back after trading the other pair of sweatpants that he didn't want for mine that was just stolen, uh, he just left and my father didn't know that he had my wallet with him. And he had also taken in one of his pockets a tzedakah box that I had that didn't have much money in it. It just had some coins, but it was what it was, right? We just found the box thrown on the floor with some coins in the street. So the reason why I say this is because I started thinking about it as I went on a walk and I started doing a little bit of people to to kind of engage with God on what was happening and why this had happened. I actually remembered a previous lesson that I was learning from a teaching or teachings of Rabbi Nachman where the reason why we don't judge is because people's circumstances allow them to reach a place where they are today. And this person, while a person may do an evil action in the moment, I wanted to be able to take a step back because if I start viewing everybody's actions as negative, is the second that I start essentially finding negativity within myself. Rabbi Nachman has a very famous lesson it's the most famous lesson of Rabbi Nachman, essentially. It's the lesson of Azamra, it's finding the good. And so today I had this struggle where I'm trying to not look at the negativity in the person that I had stolen from me and also finding the good within them because I know that if I find negativity in them, it's while I still have negativity within myself that I have to repair. Because I can only see something that exists because I allow it to exist. And so if I'm choosing to find only good in people and I only see the good in the end of time, Therefore, it means that there's only good within myself. So part of my work that we need to do in this world, myself and everybody itself included, is to always find the good so that we can only be good. We had shared in a different class in the very beginning um, of this section when we were discussing the Ilula of Rabbi Natan of Breslev, how Rabbi Natan was very special because Rabbi Natan always judged every single Jew from the good side. Just like Rabbi Levi Yitzhak of Barijab, always finding the good in every single Jew to the point that it's written that Hashem judges people midah can I give midah. So if you only find the good in another Jew, therefore when you go up there, after a person passes away after 120 years, hopefully have accomplished all that they could have accomplished, whenever they're judging him and the angels come to be able to vouch for the person's good or bad, they're not able to judge on the negative. Because if a person always found good in another person, then they'll never be judged negatively themselves because just as you could never find negative in another person so to Hashem will never find negative within you and this corresponds directly to the name of God of the kid 
the name of Hashem of Aleph Hey Yud Hey. Why? Because it's the highest name of God. It's the name of God that when you decide that you're going to be abundantly kind to people, even though they don't deserve it, maybe, who's to say that they don't deserve it, right? The whole point of what I was trying to say was that this person, maybe through his life experiences, maybe this person grew up in a circumstance where he didn't have parents, he grew up as a homeless, I didn't see the person. Maybe he went through a life that was incredibly difficult that put him into circumstances that only allowed him to live that way. Would I rather be in his shoes or in my shoes and choose myself to not be a thief? Would I rather take that test? No, obviously not. So yeah, I happen to go through something difficult, minorly difficult, thank God. And, I, and part of what I'm working on is being able to try to look at the good in it. And the reason why I bring it up is, aside from the fact that it's relevant, it's also very important to understand for this because I'm personally sharing my own struggle that I'm going through to try to find the good in that. And the reason why this is very important is because it directly relates to a second part of this, of this lesson, which is the part that I wanted to actually talk about tonight, and it's partly connected with the previous class. And last time we, we left off at the concept of waiting, right? There's an aspect in tshuva when you're waiting for the next step, right? Because a person cannot do tshuva and just run endlessly towards God. There's a process in which if you start to take on too much, like for example, let's say right now a person doesn't keep kosher and they're starting to come back to God, Sorry if there's extra noise. Yeah, we'll wait for the, <laughs> the plane and the helicopters to pass. <clears throat> if you start running to try to get closer to God, and let's say you start keeping kosher, Shabbat, um, mikveh, shomer negiyah, um, all the halachot, every single prayer, you start learning every single day, multiple hours a day, you're going to burn out. <clears throat> and it's normal, it's because... There's an aspect of the tshuva kabbalistically and mystically, and Rabbi Nachman talks about it, and the Zohar talks about it, where as you're moving through your process, you're elevating different people along the way. There's interactions that are happening. There's sparks from the dark places that you went to that you're going to elevate. And while you're doing that, if you go up too much, you're passing things that you should be doing in that process. And so Hashem is making you do exactly what you need to do. There's a reason why God slowly revealed himself in steps to Moshe. It says that when Hashem saw Moshe at the burning bush, he already began the revelation, it's written in the Midrash, of how he was going to reveal himself to him at the mountain at Har Sinai. So Hashem already understood, more than understood, but there was already the beginning of the process of revelation, meaning that Moshe could not accept the degree of Hashem's revelation at Har Sinai at the bush, because he was not at that level yet. There's a process, there's a waiting process. And so too, we have that waiting that also happens with us. There's times where we get into a situation that's maybe a little bit difficult, we get tested. And that's the parts that I wanna talk about tonight. The parts where you're getting tested and the parts where you're being pushed back and you need to understand how to move forward. And that's part of why I brought up the personal story and why I think it hit me tonight and why I think it's relevant to be able to share here. Because I think everybody goes through tests and everybody goes through difficult situations. And part of navigating life is going through those difficult situations and those tests. Specifically with waiting, I thought it was remarkable. I think the best example of waiting in the whole Torah is the story of Avraham Avinu. Avraham Avinu on the third day does the story of the Brit Milah. He's 99 years old. He waits outside. It says that Hashem took the sun out of its pocket, essentially showing that the heat of the sun was so strong that day. And Rabbi Nachman says that the sun on that day, the strength of the heat of the sun is a symbolism of the Yetzirah, the Satan, the Sitra Achra. And that a person's being tested. Why? Because it's the most difficult day. It's telling you that the third day of the Brit Milah is the most difficult. And so Avram, on his level, in his version, the Brit Milah was one of the tests. <clears throat> and what's remarkable is that you see Avram sitting, right? He's sitting there and he's waiting at the entrance of the tent. And I just find it phenomenal that there's this aspect that Avram is there. He's being essentially beat up by the Yetzirah. He's being overwhelmed, overtaken. And funny enough, it's exactly in that moment that Hashem reveals Himself to Avram. And funny enough, a step further from that, after Hashem reveals Himself to Avram, Avram kind of tells Hashem, wait one second, there's some guests that are coming and I want to do Achnasat Rochim, which was actually the angels that were going to eventually reveal, one of them was going to reveal that he was going to have Yitzchak. And so through the darkness of him being tested, you're being tested, you get put into a very dark situation. It's a level in where you're starting to grow and you're passing through tests, you're passing through levels. Hashem is now engaging. He's saying, okay, I see it's very difficult 
and you're holding your job, you're doing your job really well, and you're holding that heat, you're holding that level, then Hashem starts to reveal Himself to you. And when Hashem reveals Himself to you, then you receive the blessing. And so there's this process of being tested before you get to the end result that you can move to your next step. And I find that phenomenal because everybody has this on so many different micro levels in their life. Sometimes it's a massive thing, which is a full year and a semester of school till you pass your test, till you can have a medical degree, right? Or till you pass and you have a degree that you can now go and graduate school. Or whether it's a situation that you're passing with an argument with a good friend that now you guys re-engage into your friendship. Or it might be a struggle that you're dealing with at work or whatever it is, but we always have these moments where there's this pressure and then there's the release. And part of it is understanding, as Rabbi Nachman's going to say over here in part four of lesson six, to be baki ba'otzeh baki ba'shov. It's a process of running and returning. It's understanding that you're going to run, you're gonna get very close to Hashem and you're gonna feel very excited in your Abodat HaKodesh. You're gonna be so down to go to Minyan. You're gonna be so down to be able to start keeping kosher or start doing a mitzvah or start praying or adding extra tehidim. And then there's the moments where you're depressed, where you fall down, where you feel like there's absolutely no, there's no salvation for anything that you're gonna do. Or a little thing that happens that's bad ruins your day. Or you can be in traffic to the point that, unfortunately, we have such lack of control and we, we don't even pull ourselves away from the circumstances anymore to the point that even something that's completely out of our control, that's not even such a big deal, really affects us. And so we have to constantly engage in our lives in a way that allow us to be able to look inside and just tweak the things and say, okay, well, why is this happening to me? And that's why Hibodidut is so important because when you speak to Hashem and you practice this form of speaking to Hashem personally and secluded in a private manner, it allows for you to engage in Hashem and for Hashem to be able to reveal Himself to you, for Hashem to be able to engage with you in this world. Because in reality, none of the things that happen to you are actually bad. All of the things that are happening are either things that you're helping to repair your soul now or you're correcting things from previous years and previous generations and previous souls before you. And so it's very important to understand that. But it's a struggle. So sometimes something's gonna hit you and it's gonna be very difficult. For that, I wanna share another story that I heard. That was a beautiful story that uh, a wonderful Hasid, the French press that Hasid shared, which his name is Nathan Uzan. And he shared this story about when he was going to Uman when he was much younger, he had met this person by the name of uh, Nachman, Rashisher. And this very special Hasid was a much older man. And he was about 70, 70, 75 years old at the time when he was telling the story. And he was a young boy. At the time now, he's in his mid 30s, I believe. And this person just passed away um, within the last 10, 20 years. And he was sharing a story to explain the concept of waiting. And the reason why I think it's so phenomenal and it's so moving because it's such a simple story. But for Breslev Hasidim, it's such an imperative concept because when you understand this through the lens of Breslev Hasidut and just in general, it shows you the power of persistence in being able to get close to Hashem. Part of the reason why we do Hidbodidut is because Hidbodidut is the constant interaction of trying to develop a relationship with Hashem. Aside from the fact that our tefillot is one of the things that we do that can change our mazalim and it can change our mazal and it can also change different decrees in the world and it can also help elevate us to much higher places. Tefillah can do things that nothing else can do. And Tefillah is essentially the highest level that a person can attain. And Hidbodidut is the, is the epitome of Tefillah because it is a constant new journey. It is not using the words written down in books by any person before that. It is not a seder of a Tefillah that you're reading whenever you read the Amidah, for example. Every time you're creating and every word that you're uttering whenever you're trying to speak to Hashem, you're creating a new path that never existed before. It's a new avenue where you can bring down blessing and where you can connect with Hashem. So it's incredibly unique. And when he was walking into the Tzion, Rabbi Natan, or I'm just saying Natan because he'd probably slap me if I called him Rav at this point. In Breslev, we don't like calling each other Rabbanim because there's the only Rav and the Rav is Rabbi, Nat is Rabbi Nachman of Breslev. So we're essentially all students and all friends amongst each other. And as Natan was walking into the Tzion, he saw Nachman over there praying and just sitting over there. And he came and he saw him and he knew that he was already a big breast of Hasid. But just being such a simple Jew, he was just sitting over there and he was just waiting in the Tzion. So Natan came to speak to him a little bit and, and ask him how he was doing. And he told him, what are you doing over here? Is everything okay? He said, yeah, I'm just waiting. I'm just waiting. So Natan didn't really think too much about it. 
and he left. And then he went to go pray, and he went to go learn, and he went to go pray on the kever, and then he, he kind of went and did more prayers and just other types of things in the, in the tzion over there, and next to the kever of Rabbi Nachman. And he came back hours later, literally many, many hours later, and to the point I think it was in the middle of the night, and he saw that this man was still there waiting. So he came back and saw him and he said, look, I'm going to get some food. Do you want me to bring you back some tea? Do you want me to bring you back some cake or something? And he told him, no, I'm over here, I'm still waiting. And at that point, Natan started to engage with him and ask him what's going on. And he told him, understand the following concept. He said, when I came to the Kever, this is already a person that was an incredibly wondrous and special Jew. These are types of chassidim that are so special and so holy that they had Ruach HaKodesh. And this is a man that's sitting over there and you would think that this is just an old man that's 75 years old, doesn't know much. And he's there sitting hours where he's not picking up a book or he's not doing anything. He's not praying, he's not doing anything. And there were moments when he was praying and he was engaging, but then he was stopping. And he was just staying there in the same moment and there was just no, no repetitive action. So he told him, he said, I want you to understand something. He said, when I came here and I started praying, and he prays every single day and he does Hibodi for hours a day. This is a person that does that type of a schedule. He told Natan that he felt nothing. He came to the Tzion of Rabbi Nachman, who's his Rav. It's an incredibly important experience and a special experience. And he didn't feel anything emotionally. So he kept praying and he kept praying and nothing was opening. So he kept begging and he kept crying and nothing was happening. So he kept reading Tikkun Eklali and doing other prayers and opening up the Tzion and nothing was changing. So he said, now I have to wait. And there's a concept of waiting in Hasidut. And that's why we, I bring this up right now with this. And he told him, you wanna know why I was waiting? He said, let me give you an example. If you go at someone's house that you really need their help, and you knock at the door, and they don't answer, and you leave, it's because you don't really, really need them right now. He said, there's a moment, and there's an experience in life, where you go, and you beg, and you knock at the door, and you don't leave. And you're literally just there. Non-stop, and you don't leave for hours on end, and you just keep on going. No one's here, They're, your friend's telling you no one's here, and you're like, it's cool, I'm waiting until they come. And you stay there, and you sit, and you wait, and you wait one day, two days, three days, four days, whatever it takes, but you don't leave. Why? Because there was a degree for this man, and this is a phenomenal lesson that's so incredible. There's a level where this person stood at 75 years old, where he was not willing to leave because he was waiting for Rabbi Nachman to come and help him. He was waiting for salvation. If we approach our connection with Sadiqim and with Hashem in this manner, where it's not just waiting by saying, there's two aspects of waiting. There's the aspect of waiting that I introduced earlier where you're being tested by the Yetzirah and it's a difficult circumstance and you're just being hit by the sun so you just need to hold your ground, right? There's a point where it's like, this is too difficult of a test and you're praying to Hashem, help me, help me, help me. And you're hoping that there'll be the click and the revelation for you to move to the next step. This is a whole other aspect of waiting. This is an aspect of waiting with persistence. It's an aspect of saying to Hashem, Hashem, I need to get married, but I'm not leaving until you make that happen. Or Hashem, I need parnasa, I need to pay my rent. I'm not leaving until you make that happen. So I'm gonna knock until you open the door. And if I leave, it's because it's not important. So he kept waiting. And he waited hours and hours and hours. And in Breslav, we have this concept where we will go and we will beg and we will wait and we'll go do Hibodi Dut for hours, on hours, on hours, on hours on end. Until we realize that Hashem answers our prayer. Or that we have an interaction that allows for us to feel that we got answered. That's part of what needs to happen. So sometimes in life, the reason why I bring this up is because it's really applicable to us because we're going to go through experiences in life where we're going to be really strongly tested from Ayat Sarah in a point where we feel like we're completely overcome. In that moment, and I was discussing this last night with some of my brother's friends that were at the house for Shabbat, there is not a greater salvation than putting your weight on Hashem. And I told every single one of them, you can do whatever you want, but my recommendation to you is go beg and pray to Hashem. Whatever it is, if you're a boy and you're working on your breed and you're having difficulty with your breed and you need help with your breed, or whatever it is, and you want to get married, and you have a path that's immet, and you want to follow a true path, and you want to get married, and you don't want to do the same types of sins that you used to do, or you want to do tshuva on your sins, keep on begging Hashem, and keep on praying to Him, and say, look, I understand this is really difficult. I used to do this sin every single week. Now I do it once a month, but I'm begging you. I don't want to do it anymore. So please help me out. Please save me from this. 
I don't want to do this anymore. It's not even me anymore that sins whenever it happens. It's my body's completely overwhelmed by the yatsah. And continue to push and push the boundary. And it applies to everything. You can apply it to limud. You can apply it to whenever you're learning. If you want to start a new language, let's say you don't read Hebrew well, but you want to start learning to read books of Torah in Hebrew so you can really understand it in the original language that it was written. Pray to Hashem. Hashem will open up your mind and allow for you to understand the Torah. Because if you believe that Hashem can do anything, Hashem can do that for sure. That's a very simple feat for Hashem. There's a person that I met personally with another friend of mine that he was discussing and we were talking about how I personally wanted to work on my Hebrew because I learn in Hebrew but sometimes I'll engage or I'll look up translation or I'll study with someone if it's a book that's a little bit sophisticated because I don't get all the Hebrew properly. I didn't get a chance to learn it really well when I was younger. So I'm working on it. But the more and more that I beg Hashem and I pray to Hashem, the more and more Hashem reveals to me. And he told me that this person begged Hashem so much to learn Hebrew, he said with his own eyes, the friend that I was with in front of this person, he said when he came and saw me, he didn't speak Hebrew at all. He said within 30 days, he was reading to me lessons in Torah and Hebrew that I saw. Because Hashem, in the opposite way as well, Hashem can give and Hashem can take as we learned from the story of Yod, right? Hashem lokeach and Hashem hoten, right? And the concept over here is that if Hashem, God forbid, wants to take away someone's memory and give them Alzheimer's, and Hashem wants to give a person the ability to be a genius and allow for them to learn something within four seconds, they can do that. It's just little sparks that happen within the mind. It's just the snap of a finger or the blink of an eye for Hashem. But from us, from our perspective, there's a tremendous amount of work that needs to happen. And most of that work, and the best way to engage in that work is through tefillah, it's through your mouth. It's through you begging Hashem and praying to Hashem. Because tefillah can change anything that exists in the world. Whether a person is sick, whether a person is healthy, whatever it is, you can do anything through tefillah. I wrote down one other note because I literally wrote down only a few things that I wanted to share tonight. On that subject that we were kind of discussing about the difficulty of why things happen and kind of understanding how to look at the good, and understanding it also with the concept of waiting, I want to pivot to the thing that would have actually been relevant tonight and just share with you a little excerpt from Likute Maran. So he says in part four of Likute Maran over here, When a person wants to go in a path of tshuva, he needs to go he needs to become really well versed in, in halakha. Halakha over here can be referenced as obviously halakha, the, the shulchan Aruch, but it's also the concept of walking, his, his following his path. That's why he specifically uses the word because there's lots of ways to interpret it and there's lots of meanings behind it. And he has to have to him two forms of bekiyut, two forms of, of proficiency and expertise. Hainu, baki barotze, baki bashot, right? The expert in running and the expert in returning. Kemo, Shekatub, as it says, Zakamen Dail Benafik, Veze Berhinat, Im Asek Shamaim, Shamata, Berhinat Ail, Berhinat Baki Baotse, Vail Seka Sheol, Minecha, Berhinat Nafik, Berhinat Baki Basho. I'll explain that last part. So he's saying over here, and he quotes from the Zohar. Yeah, that was the part that I want to leave off at. We'll continue the rest of it another time. But this is a very, very important aspect of this lesson, of lesson six. And just to kind of show people where we're at in this lesson, we discussed how the next part after this, the waiting is an aspect of tshuva. And tshuva, and in that process of waiting, is the aspect of you being able to overcome the etzara. And then it jumps to this, okay? The reason why it's relevant is because it says in the Zohar, over here it's quotes from the Zohar and Vayikra. It's Sefer Vayikra, it says that Deserving one, it's talking about the person who enters and exits, and that's why he's referencing the Bakiba Hotse Bakiba Shul. Specifically, as it quotes from Tehilim, if I ascend to heaven, there you are, and that's Imasek Shamaim Shamata, right? If I go up to the heavens, then there you are, Berhinatayil, right? Which is the aspect of ascending, which is the aspect of running over here, but that's Hotse, and that's what he says, Berhinat Bakiba Hotse, Vaya Sheol Hine. Uh, and this is and he says if I and then he quotes the other aspect of Tehilim and he says over there that if I descend into the pits of hell that's kind of adding a couple extra words there but it's saying if I make my bed in hell there you are too now the thing that's remarkable about this 
and he says, that's Baki Bashop, that's returning. We said in the beginning, earlier, just a few moments ago, that there's this aspect of tshuva that you can't continue to run because you'll just, you'll, you'll exhaust yourself, it's too much, right? You'll overwhelm the system. And that's the aspect of running up to heaven. So Rabbi Nachman and Rabbi Natan share with us something phenomenal. They say that if you think that you're doing really well, know that you have a long way to go. That's the aspect of running. So people think that if they're sitting down in Beit Midrash and they're learning Torah and they feel like they're doing tshuva and they're praying and they're having the best prayers, know that Hashem is very far from you. Why? Because you can continue to run, you can continue to go. And there's lots of different ways to interpret it. But he says something amazing. And this directly relates to our parshiot and it's not a coincidence that we're learning this randomly right now with the parshiot and me personally as it relates to my own personal life as I was dealing with this. That's why I thought about this with this class. He says, if I make my bed in hell, here you are too. And David Melach is saying to Hashem over here, and Rabbi Nachman references it, and this is the concept of Ayeh. There's a lesson in Nikutei Maran that talks about Ayeh. When you scream to Hashem from the pits of hell, from the depths of your despair, from the sin, from the darkness of I can't breathe anymore, I can't see anything anymore, I'm being tested. It's the sun is so hot that Avram is just waiting there. When you feel overwhelmed, know that Hashem is right next to you. It's something that's remarkable. Because we have this difficulty in life that we think that when we're sinning, Hashem is very far away from us. We're the Jews in Egypt, right? The Jews that sinned, they didn't care about the Torah, they didn't care about the mitzvot, because even though they didn't have the Torah and the mitzvot, they had the concept of, they still understood a lot of the concept of being able to get close to God. And the Jews always felt this concept that as they sin or they're not good enough or they're people that have never had that opportunity. That's why I brought this up with the person that's taken the wallet because who am I to judge the person? We had this circumstance that happened this past week in shul and I, I don't wanna take any type of honor for this at all, but a homeless man walked into the shul that I was praying at for Mincha Navit this past week and the person kind of looked a little bit dirty and he, was, he seemed a little bit different than what normal people would call a normal person, right? And he started a little bit like singing and mumbling and he walked into the shul. But he was a guy that's come in multiple times to the shul, maybe in the past and helped out with Minyan. So the person was not necessarily a, a normal person by anyone's standards, but nonetheless, he was coming to the Minyan very late, late at night and it was just very bizarre. He was just holding lots of things. And he came into the room and he touched someone's book because he just wanted to take someone's seat door to pray. Now, obviously, not n most people don't do that. If someone's in the middle of their prayer and they have a book in front of them and he just grabs it and wants to start to pray. So everybody started treating this person really badly. Now, in reality, after I saw everybody start screaming at him and treating him very poorly, which they thought was justified and I didn't, I grabbed him and I said, look, come here, I'll give you a seat door. And I gave him a seat door and I sat him down. And then he was able to pray and a lot of people were really disturbed by the whole situation. But I didn't get a chance to talk to them because I didn't want to really lecture people or anything like that. And I'm not saying any names on purpose because it's not relevant and I'm not here to judge anyone or judge myself or judge anything. But the reason, my first thought that went into my mind is that there is no person, and I was talking about this with Rabbi Moshe as well on Shabbat when he was at the house. There is no person under the sun that doesn't sin, that doesn't do something bad. And in fact, we do a lot of things that are very bad all the time. But the reality of it is, is that it taints us. It makes us technically look bad, smell bad, whenever we enter into the palace of God. And our neshama is distraught. And it's literally put in so much disturbing situations that our neshama is technically experiencing homelessness. It's away from home. It's constantly involved in sin. It never has the opportunity to be able to engage in Hashem. Even our thoughts are not pure. And we are, figuratively speaking, this person that walks into a shul that we don't recognize, doesn't look good, doesn't smell good, he's engaging with people in a way that doesn't make any sense. And I said to myself, this is me in the way of Hashem. So if I start judging him badly, then I myself am gonna get judged terribly because I'm filled with a bunch of sins. So I can't allow that. So I need to have Rahmanut on him so that I myself will have Rahman to myself. It's not even because of the grace of God or doing it selflessly. I did it, self, I did it selfishly, in fact. But for me, it didn't make any sense to treat a person that way. That was a lot easier because he didn't hurt my kavod. The wallet situation started to hurt my kavod a little bit because now 
I have to deal with situations where I don't have my accounts. He had fraud on my accounts and I have to dispute the charges. So all of a sudden now it starts to become a little personal and I get affected by it. But I have to bring in this lesson to teach me that I don't deserve that honor. That money wasn't mine in the first place. If Hashem decided that, that was gonna happen, that's good. So every step that I'm doing, I need to create a space for Hashem and I need to constantly remind myself of this. Thankfully, I had a test that was able to be subtle enough that while it still hurts, I'm able to overcome it. And I pray that Hashem gives me the strength to overcome it. But the reason why I brought up the book and the Siddur is because we are that type of person. We're not perfect. And we need to be able to engage in Shuba constantly in a way that we can get closer to Hashem. And we need to do it in a way that's selfless, that we only see the good. And when we only see the good, Hashem will only judge us for the good. And the reason why this is so important is because we unfortunately live in a world today where everybody is filled with judgment. Everybody's always looking to judge another person. The second you can sit in a conversation with a few of your friends and we just drop someone's name, watch how quickly someone starts talking about them. And unfortunately, I don't know how often we share things that are very good about everybody all the time. Even sometimes when we joke, we can embarrass someone and it can damage a lot. And so it's very, very important to be careful the way that we speak and the way that we talk, the way that we engage so that we can do this. So the beauty of this lesson Part of the process of tshuva is understanding and becoming, as he says over here, an expert. An expert in running and returning. Why? Because you're going to have opportunities in life where you're feeling really good and you're doing really good in your tshuva. And you're waking up and you're doing tikkun chatzot or you're doing your prayers or you're doing tehillim every single day or you're wearing your tefillin now because you started doing tefillin every single day. So you feel good about yourself. Good, feel good, bi besimcha. But understand that you have a long way to go because Hashem wants you to do more. And Hashem wants you to get closer to Him. And the second you feel very down, understand that that's part of the process. It's completely normal to fall. It's completely normal to sin. And it's completely normal to come back from there. So understand that as you fall and as you descend, be able to recognize what happened. Be able to say, I'm sorry. And be able to bring Hashem into the process. But also look for Hashem. Say, Aye. Because when Hashem... When Hashem's first creation, Adam, came into the world, after Adam had sinned and ate from the tree, Hashem says to Adam, Ayeka, where are you? Before he does any damage, before Hashem decides to decree that death is going to come into the world, before anything happens, he says, Ayeka, where are you? Why? Because we learn from that that even after he sinned, there was the opportunity of tshuva, but Adam didn't understand it yet. Adam was so down and depressed from what he had done, and every single person goes through this. Sometimes you feel so down that you can't repair. Nachman famously says, if you think you can destroy, believe that you can rebuild as well. So just as much as we walk around and we think to ourselves, I've done this much wrong, I'll never be able to do this, I'll never be Shomer, I'll never be this, I'll never be that. Forget the titles or forget the politics or forget the aspects of things, the way that other people present it. Take it for what it is. Look at the Ketusha behind something. When a person wants to take it upon themselves to be a holy Jew and separate themselves from other people, for example, if you're a girl and you want to be married and you want to work on yourself and be Shomer Nekiyah and not touch boys, forget of all the aspects that are associated with the fact that someone's going to talk badly about you or do this or do that. Because understand that that darkness and that sun pounding down on you is the test before the revelation. I'm not saying that everybody should go do that. Everybody has to do things in their level. Like we said, you can't just sprint. You can't just run forever. You can't go onto a treadmill and sprint for the next five hours. It won't happen. You run, you jog, you walk. Then you grab some water, then you guard again. It's not possible. Even Sadiqim fall. There's levels in which Sadiqim also sin. It's not levels in which we can fathom and understand, but there's levels and degrees in which they sin as well. So understand this really well and understand that this is a process that we need to work on constantly, every single day. And this is incredibly important. The last thing I'm going to share with everybody, how are we doing on timing? Uh, almost 45 minutes, we're okay. Cool. I'll share with you guys one last story um, that I think is really relevant and beautiful. And then we can take some questions. It actually ended up going longer than I had expected for something I didn't prepare, but. One of the last Chosh Hashanahs of Rabbi Nachman's life, was the second to last or the last one, I don't remember exactly, so I don't want to be incorrect with what I'm saying. So it's either the last one or the second to last one. And he passed away 15 days after his last Rosh Hashanah because he passed away, um, actually 18 days, because he passed away on the fourth night of Sukkot. 
and that's the night of Netzach, which is the Sefirah that he's associated with. It's the night of Moshe Rabbeinu because he's associated with Moshe Rabbeinu. So there's a lot on that. We had a lot of beautiful classes around Sukkot time on the night, the fourth night, which is the night of Moshe and the night of Rabbi Nachman. So those are stories for another time. But he specifically had these last Rosh Hashanahs of his life. And in this either second to last or last Rosh Hashanah of his life, he was gifted by all his students a brand new white beautiful garment with a lot of different types of gems on it. And it was a fantastic garment that they wanted to offer him as of course their Rav and as a special token of their appreciation for everything that he does. And so he wore it on Rosh Hashanah. And as he wore the white garments, as he was going to do Tashlich on the second day, he was walking down towards the river and he was incredibly weak in which makes me feel as if it was his actually his last Rosh Hashanah because it says that he couldn't even walk. He could barely walk that people were helping him hold him up as he was going to the river to do Tashlich. So as he stood there, when he finished doing Tashlich, he tried to walk and he slipped and he fell in the mud. And if you can imagine the scene, you have the, the Rebbe essentially, the, the great and holy light which is Rabbi Nachman of Breslev, in the mud with his brand new garment completely dirtied and immediately everybody jumps to try to help him and he tells them wait he puts his hand up and he says let me stay here for a moment and for those that have been coming to the classes they know that Rabbi Nachman did a tremendous amount of incredible things that nobody understood literally nobody understood we can do hours and hours of studies of even just mundane words in conversation that he said that nobody understood that he was correcting worlds and correcting souls with just the words that was coming out of his mouth with just his breath, he said that I can do with just one sigh what a tzaddik can do in 70 years. A tzaddik gamo. It's not a regular person, we're talking about a tzaddik. With just his sigh. There are things that we can't really understand. These are only things at the level of the Arizal Moshe Rabbeinu, Abishman Mar Yochai, the Baal Shem Tov. So he stands there and he says, wait. And no one understood what was happening. And he was smiling as he was being dirtied in the mud and he was standing there. Because he was receiving the bracha of Hashem. And he said in that darkness that other people see as something really negative and really bad that's happening, embarrassment, the dirtiness, all of it, he said, I just received as he stood up after standing there for quite some time, when everyone helped him up after, he said, I just received the secret of why bad things happen to good people. The source of it, which he said that Moshe was not able to receive because it's a secret that can only be attained if you enter into the 50th gate of Bina. Now he said, I was able to achieve it because the 50th gate of Bina can only be attained by entering into the land of Israel. And Rabbi Nachman journeyed to enter the land of Israel. There's lots of stories about the importance of the land of Israel and why the land of Israel is so special and what allows it to be able to gain that. But if you're a tzaddik amur and you're a tzaddik of this type of degree, you can repair all the levels and you can get to the levels of understanding up until the 49th. And Rabbi Nachman had Torah that Likut comes from a level that's even above Bina. It's a Torah that's pulled from even higher than the levels of Bina. But in the concepts of Bina for the Kabbalah, for those that understand, there's 50 pathways specifically that are within Bina in degrees. And he was able to understand a secret that comes from the 50th gate that no one understood. And he said he was able to understand it in that moment, through that darkness of being able to sit there and wait. When other people don't understand what's going on and people see suffering, through that moment, he's able to do something that other people cannot. He said, because I was able to descend into a place that no one else can descend. The thing about why bad things happen to good people, this we cannot understand. Because this is the aspect of the way God works on some of his upper realms. And I was telling people recently that we need to start shifting the way, and I think I also brought this up in last week's class, uh, specifically the Parsha class that I was doing, that we need to stop asking questions that send us to brick walls, that don't give us movement. And by that I mean, when you ask God a question that you will never receive an answer to, you're putting yourself in a position that doesn't allow you to grow, doesn't allow you to move, it doesn't allow you to improve. So for example, when I'm asking God, why did the wallet get taken? And why is this bad thing happening to me? Or why did I lose my job? If I'm not going to understand God's method, some people are holy tzaddikim that can understand specifically why something happened. But some people are not, like most people. 
because most of us are not mekubalim that can understand the source of why some things are happening. Not all things, but some things. What happens is you hit a situation where you're bothered and you're overwhelmed by circumstances that are not only out of your control, but I'll never get that answer, so I'm constantly blocked. But if I ask God, I start my conversation by saying, why is this happening to me? But what I'm really shifting the conversation to is how is this supposed to help me? Hmm. Or how can I become better? Or I understand that this happened and I understand that you only do good. But if you only do good and this happened to me and I see it as bad, then one, help me see the good or help me get to a level where I don't get into a situation where these types of things happen to me. Because in reality, the fact that I'm seeing it as bad means that there's something wrong with me. So help fix that. Help make me only see good. So I'm telling you, God, I'm being honest with you. Right now, someone hit my car. I'm really angry about it. And I don't understand how that's good, but I know you only do good. So help me see the good that you see. So help me see what's part of it or why I'm doing this or why that happened. And help me out and protect me because I can't take that test. It's too much for me. So please help me. But you can only do that engagement and you can only have that meaning and you can only have that connection when you're ready to have that conversation with Hashem. And all of these processes are tshuva. Every single conversation, every single moment is an opportunity to be able to return. That's why the word tshuva is to return to God. Because every word, every speech, every conversation, every thought is an aspect of returning to God. That's why Rabbi Nachman says tshuva and tshuva. That's why he says tshuva, you do it a hundred times a day, a thousand times a day. We shared the story about how the person was crazy in the courtyard. Why? Because he was doing everything and he was doing somersaults in front of God only for the glory of God. He said, yeah, but then you're going to become crazy if you start thinking about doing tshuva on every bad thought you have. Yeah, well then you'll become crazy, but then you'll also become the most cherished person of the king. Because every single moment of your life will just be, I'm sorry I just had a bad thought, help me remove those bad thoughts. I just want to be close to you. I just want to see your godliness in this world. I just want to do things that are right. So help me see that. And I'm sorry that I had that again. I had another bad thought. I'm sorry, like I eat non-kosher sometimes, occasionally when I'm peer pressured by my friends. Help me remove that. So I, okay, I went out and I ate something non-kosher. So Rabbi Nachman says that when a person does a sin, he does two sins. And the Yetzirah really wants you to do the second sin. The Yetzirah doesn't even really care about the first sin. But when you eat non-kosher food, and when you're doing tshuva, you're going to fall into depression. You're going to start doing the following. You're going to go to the pit of hell. And that pit of hell is in your mind. So from that depth of that hell, what's going to happen is you're going to start calling out. You're not going to call out to Hashem. The Yetzirah is going to win. So the two sins that the person does, for example, let's say it's non-kosher, a person does non-kosher, and then he falls into depression. Rabbi Nachman's whole joy and whole concept in this world was to teach people joy, to teach people simcha. And he says, you sinned? Okay, you sinned. Baraka, move on to the next one. Yalla, that's it, enough. Not to say that the sin doesn't matter, God forbid. It's you're already engaging in doing heed body You're already talking to Hashem every single day. So, okay, you fell. Okay, you had a bad thought. Okay, you did this sin. Okay, you did that sin. So what? Next. You're going to talk to Hashem about it later. You're going to do bidu about it later. But just don't fall into depression because the Yetzirah doesn't care about the sin itself. The Yetzirah wants you into depression because when you're in depression, you don't move. You don't see Hashem. You don't want to return. There is no recreation. There is no heed chachut. There is no renewing of yourself. There is no, I'm going to start new again. But Rabbi Nachman didn't care about progress. Don't think about things as like, I need to start doing tailing for the next 30 days. That's cool. If that's going to help motivate you and that's going to bring you to Simcha, do it. But if you stop at uh, day 27 and you forgot about it and then you fall into depression, don't. It doesn't matter. Every day counts as number one. Only do tailing one day. Because part of the biggest sin that Jews do, not sin, part of the biggest failure that Jews do, spiritually speaking, is they try to do too much. Too much too much running without returning. And when you're gonna fall, you're gonna have to know how to get back up. But if you start thinking to yourself, okay, well, let's say you've been trying to do tikkun akhlali. And I say, okay, do tikkun akhlali for 30 days. You're like, that's way too hard. Tikkun akhlali, I've never read it before. My Hebrew is not really good. So like, it's gonna take me like more or less 20 minutes, 25 minutes to read it. For a person that does it Hebrew really well, can probably do it in six minutes, seven minutes, depending on how fast they read it. So you're like 25 minutes a day, that's a hard commitment. Well, it's only a hard commitment because you're thinking about 25 minutes every single day for the next 30 days. But what about if you told yourself, do tikkun akhlali once, and you know what? Don't even start by doing the whole tikkun akhlali. Can you just read the first one, the number 16, which will take you about two minutes? And can you just do that today? Just today, that's it. I don't care about tomorrow, just today. 
But if you speak to Hashem and you engage with Hashem and you continue to speak with Him and you continue to engage with Him over and over and over again, then you'll beg Him, you'll say, okay, I did 16, I'm so excited. Hashem, I know that that came from you. Can you please let me do 16 tomorrow again? Or maybe tomorrow you let me do 16 and 32 so I can do two of the Tikkun Akali. Two of the 10. If you approach Hashem with that simplicity and that much help, everything you do is with the help of Hashem. To the point that also, God forbid, if a person falls and sins, it's also not that. Everything is good and everything is Hashem. So Hashem only wants to see your will and Hashem wants to see your effort. And Bezat Hashem, as we continue to work through this lesson and work through Tshuva, let's continue to work and let's continue to engage because things are gonna, ha things are gonna hit us as we're learning these lessons that are going to make you realize that sometimes it's a moment to wait. Sometimes you're in a descent, sometimes you're in ascent. And recognize those moments in your life and engage with them and speak to Hashem so you can continue to grow and continue to get closer to Hashem. Because there's nothing greater than being able to have this crown that he speaks about in Lesson 6, which is the Kvod the, the crown of Hashem. Because the real glory, the greatest glory a person can attain in this world is being able to experience the presence of Hashem always. That you live in the house of Hashem always through every single day of your life, as David Amalek says in Tehim. So Bezat Hashem will be able to bring the Mashiach with this. Amen. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have any uh, questions? We can keep it on if anybody has any questions immediately. If not, then we'll turn it off after. Was anything unclear? Yeah, go ahead. Not unclear, I just, if you could elaborate on a point. You mentioned, so we know um, going and returning. Yeah. And this is a concept of, I'm wondering if you could explain the concept that it says that the Sadiq is gonna call, fall seven times before he gets. Yeah. What, have, what is that, what, why seven times, what is that about? And I'm sure it's connected to this, but why seven times why does he have to go through that process good question the number seven specifically i mean i have some ideas in my head um as for the seven i i don't i don't know if it's a hundred percent accurate um seven specifically i mean seven is a realm of perfection for this world so for example the shabbat is the seventh day of the week right we know that shabbat ki it's the essence of all the beacha so when people do shabbat properly they receive all their beacha that's what they're supposed to receive during the week they receive it um greatly in part and due to the Shabbat. And people that do Shabbat properly understand that Shefa. And it's not just bracha of parnasa. people need to understand that when we talk about bracha or when we talk about Shefa, it's not that you're just gonna get money. It's the essence of the bracha that Hashem sends you that it gives you everything. It's healing, blessing, it's, it's the ability to be able to let you speak, it's the ability to have the ease in, in the things that you're gonna do in life, it's to properly position you. Even in the test that you're going to receive, it's being positioned in a way that allows you to achieve something even greater. Because only through the darkness and through that pitfall, it allows you to ascend. That's the point of the whole thing. It's not necessarily specific seven, even though seven I'm sure has some significance. And like I said, seven is a form of perfection that to achieve that form of perfection in this world or to have that Shabbat, Shabbat, the concept of the peace, the resting, getting to a place where you are with Hashem, you need to be able to fall and get back up. And that is true peace, right? Yaakov Avinu asked Hashem essentially the question. He's saying, why is it that, uh, similar question to Moshe Rabbeinu, right? Why do bad things happen to to, to good people, and Yaakov, right, will, will ask the question, is there any peace really in this world? And Hashem says no, because Yaakov passed through a tremendous amount of tests, and Abraham also had tests, right? We know that in Bnei there was 10 plagues, but also there's a parallel to the 10 different types of tests that Abraham had to pass. And by the way, what was the 10th test that Abraham had to pass? The Akedat Yitzchak. And so all of it was essentially leading up into a specific point that you get to this massive salvation. Now, the truth is that when you fall, and the reason why Tzaddik falls, one very simple lesson we learn from that is that if Tzaddik falls seven times and gets up, the point of it is that he gets up. He falls, one, Tzaddik, people think Tzaddikim don't fall. One, he falls, and number two, he gets up. You know, personally for me, when we talk about Tzaddikim and we talk about Rishayim, I have a very different conception of it. I think that Tzaddikim, I think everybody is, I think everybody's a Tzaddik. Like I said, I, I try to only look at the good in people. I, I genuinely do not see any Rishayim. It gets to a very, it gets to a difficult place when, when, you're see, when you start talking about people that are incredibly corrupt and have done a tremendous amount of negative actions in this world, then there's a level in which only a tzaddik can judge that person from the good. Rabbi Nachman talks about it. Only a tzaddik gamo of a very, very high level can find the good in a rasha gamo. But in reality, there's only good in people. Even there's one good point, even in a person that's an absolute terrific person the worst person you can imagine. And it's difficult, and I'm trying to find that good. Like I said, I was working on that for the person that had taken my money, right, taking my, my wallet. 
And so when it comes to the person that falls seven times and gets up, as it says in Avot, I think that there's a strong aspect of being able to recognize that the process of being able to get back up after you fall, it takes a tremendous amount of strength. And no matter what you do, you have to understand that you're going to get tested, you're gonna get pushed in this life, like Yaakov Avinu. There's nothing easy about this world. There's no breaks, like even in kids, like they tell you when you're in school, like, okay, you're gonna go on winter break, but it's not vacation from Shacharit Minchan Arvit, right? Like, there is no break from being able to pray to Hashem, Shacharit Minchan Arvit. But the question is, how tedious is it to you for you to pray Shacharit Minchan Arvit? Like, is it actually something that's tedious for you? Like, do you not want to pray to God? It's actually, it made me think of something that's actually phenomenal. It was a question I was thinking about this week that I think is very powerful. Have a good night. Thanks, thank you so much. If I, like for example, like think about something right now that you really enjoy. Like let's say it's, it's cooking, let's say it's hanging out with friends, let's say it's going to a bar, let's say it's playing video games, Call of Duty, let's say it's playing FIFA, let's say it's watching a basketball game on TV. What, something you really enjoy that's not in Kedusha because unfortunately we are involved in a world that we engage in so many things that are not Kodesh, watching a movie, whatever it is, like your, your guilty pleasure, right? And even God forbid if it was a sin, right? Like I'm just saying like, think about something, unfor unfortunately, that you derive pleasure and be honest about it. And think about it this way. Do you gain that much pleasure when you open up a book of Torah, or when you read Tehidim? And the answer for so many people is no. You genuinely don't. There are some times where you're gonna feel really good after a prayer. You feel like, you know what? You really feel connected to Hashem. Great. How often does that last? The reality is we're so damaged as people that we've gotten to a point that our physical bodies, look how much the Yitzhara has already beaten us. That we don't derive anywhere near the degree of, of pleasure that we have whenever we do something material. And we have to beg Hashem to repair that for us because we'll never be able to do that on our own way. It's only Hashem that can take us to that place. And so it's beautiful to think about the idea that we have a tremendous amount of journey to be able to go. But I want to get to a place where I'm not doing Shacharit Min Chan Ravit because it's mandatory or because God commanded it. Genuinely. That's not the point of Judaism for me. Like I don't want to be a person that's sitting down and learning Torah because someone told me I have to sit down and learn Torah. I don't want to do a mitzvah because someone told me to do a mitzvah. Mm -hmm. I want to do a mitzvah, and there's a lesson in the that talks about this, I think it's lesson five, where he says that the schar mitzvah, it talks about schar mitzvah, mitzvah, and schar avera, avera, right? That says that a tzaddik gets the reward of one mitzvah is another mitzvah, and the reward of an avera is another avera. What's the deal with that? Well, because Rabbi Nachman says in lesson five, he says that when a person does a mitzvah for the actual essence of the mitzvah, you see the, this is more Kabbalistic, but you actually experience the Kedusha of Hashem. You experience the Shekinah of Hashem. So if you're dwelling with Hashem, and you're a real tzaddik, that all you live for is the experience of the glory of Hashem, then all you want, you don't even want the schar of the mitzvah because the schar of the mitzvah is in the next world. Like you don't even want that, you don't even care about that. You just want to live with Hashem now. So if you're living for the reward of Hashem in the future, but you don't care about living with Hashem now, it's fake on the level of a real tzaddik. And a lot of people don't understand that. Even tzaddikim, even people in yeshivot today, even people that are very religious, they don't get this. They do things because they're like, oh, they think they have this great place in Olam Abba and they sit down and learn all day long. That's great, don't get me wrong. I don't want to take something away from anybody at all. But my point is that if you're not doing something for the actual essence and the root of the whole point of it, it's wrong. Now, I personally, I recognize that myself, I'm very far away from that. But I want to do it for that path. So my conversations with Hashem are to help me engage so that when I put on my tefillin and I'm wrapping my hand and I put on my tefillin, I want to actually put on the tefillin, not because I'm forced to put on tefillin, but when I wrap for my middle finger, specifically, I want to understand the kabana of being able to say that I'm marrying Hashem on the spot. I want to know what it's like that I'm loving Hashem as if I'm getting married. And it, the fact that I don't feel that, the fact that I don't feel like I'm marrying Hashem, and the fact that I don't feel like I'm married to Hashem right now, I'm such, a, I'm such a disgusting human being that I'm so far away from you that I don't get that. Please repair me, fix me, because I want to be married to you. I want to feel that love. And I don't want to do it for the mitzvah. I don't care about the mitzvah. I want to do it because I want to feel you. I want to be able to understand you. I want to live with you. So we have to be able to remove ourselves from these situations and understand that we're... We have to rebuild ourselves in Torah. And Rabbi Nachman is very good at being able to rebuild the concepts. And this is why he's very controversial because when he talks in very controversial ways, people don't understand it. But everything I'm saying is very logical. It makes a lot of sense. At least to me it does. So back then, of course, a lot of people went against him because it was the work of the Sitra Akra. And 
I mean, I was talking with Chavim Moshe today, we were talking about Amincha. Even the Zohar HaKadosh says something that's incredibly controversial. It says in the end of time, it says that the rabbis are going to be doing the work of the Yitzah and pushing people away from Judaism. Mm -hmm. It's very, very dark. And I mean, it's, I mean we, we can look it up and we can, we can discuss it. Rabbi Nachman talks about it, the Gemara discusses it. The rabbi, it says, Rabbanim Shel, Shek, Shel Sheker. It's false rabbis, it's fake rabbis. It's the concept of Korach, essentially. Think about the Torah. Korach came with the, with the, essentially, the leaders of all the tribes, the holiest people, the Rashi Yeshivot, the holiest people, the people that were the smartest, the people that were the heads of the tribes, the most intellectual, the people that understood the, the most holiness, and Korach, and it says that Korach technically had more chokhmah than Moshe in a certain aspect, right? Because he's arguing with Moshe, the halacha, right? And there's the argument between either the Mezuzar, the Tzitzit, the Tchelet, yeah. right? And so there's this conversation that he's trying to defeat Moshe. And what's happening to Moshe? Moshe, first of all, if he wanted to, he could have just burnt everyone with his eyes if he just wanted to. Or just be able to use his staff, which would have had a specific name of Hashem and tapped it into the, world, into the earth and immediately everyone would have been destroyed on the spot if he wanted to. Mm -hmm. Because the staff of Moshe, if you read the Zohar in the section in last week's parasha, it says where the place and where Moshe's staff comes from, which is essentially a place in Gan Eden, it's essentially above the level of where Aaron's staff came from. That's why if Moshe's staff had done this, this thing with the miracles, of it, it would have been even more insane that it would have just immediately prompted the redemption. It had to be done from the staff of Aaron, which was even lower, but it was already incredibly powerful. It wasn't that Aaron took Moshe's staff, there were two separate staffs? It's two staffs. Interesting. Kabbalistically. And Aaron's staff, people don't know. People think that Aaron threw his staff on the floor and it turned to a snake, and then the snake ate the snakes of the other thing. But actually what happened was is that Aaron's staff turned into a snake, then they had snakes, then Aaron's snake turned back into a staff, and the staff ate the snakes. <laughs> So when the Egyptians saw that the staff ate the snakes, they said, okay, now we're messing with something that's way above nature here. Um, and, and I bring this up, not, not necessarily to bring up controversy, but to understand that the way that we, we learn Judaism is in a very broken fashion. It's in a fashion that has a lot of judgment. And it actually brings me back, and I think this will kind of come full circle to kind of finish up all these ideas. And thank you for the question, because it really helped bring some extra things to the surface. When we bring up the name Ekieh, and in last week's parasha, when Hashem says to Moshe, and Moshe, uh, and he says the name of Yudke Babke, we discussed this already a few times. When you decide to act through the ways that Hashem's character traits are on these names of God, when you act of the name of Hashem of Ikye, the name of Tshuva, the name of abundant kindness, the name of the father that sits in the room and he lets his son destroy everything in the house. Why? Because we're that son in that house that destroys everything, every sin, every bad thought. But what does he do? He doesn't get angry. He hugs him and he embraces him. He says, are you done now? Now let's come back and let's fix this. It's the same guy that walks in, the boy that I shared in the very beginning of the story, that steals from the man in business over and over and over again. And then the guy's compassion. He doesn't fire him. He doesn't send him out on the street. He sees a Jew and he says, let me help you. And he lets him do tshuva and he pays him and he gives him bonuses, even from his own money that he doesn't even have. Because Hashem takes from everything that He has to give you all your sustenance. But if you see Hashem as a God by the name of Elohim and you see Him as a form of judgment that comes out to the world and if you do this sin, then you go to Gainam and if you do this, then you're not a good Jew and if you do this, then you're a Rasha. Like I said earlier and I didn't explain, I just view, my view on Tzadik and Rasha is everybody's a Tzadik. Tzadik and Rasha is a fine line. Every person is walking around a Tzadik. The second you do a bad action, you tip into the, into the land of Yetzirah, you tip into the concept of Rasha. And if you do a good thing, you're a tzaddik. So a person could be a Rasha Gamur, in quotation marks, walk into a shul, open up a book of Torah, tzaddik, on the spot, he's a tzaddik. Because there's only the moment that you're living in. That's it. And in that moment, if he decides to bring down godliness and be close to Hashem in that moment, that's it, that's all that matters. So if I decide to live my life with the name of Hashem of Ekyeh, of the concept of tshuva, that I only see the good, that I'm only deciding to see essentially every single good aspect of every single Jew, then that's the form of God that I'm bringing out to this world. I'm not gonna live and I'm not gonna go, and I'm not gonna pass away from this world believing in another God. Because that's a God, honestly, that's too limited and too low for me. I decided that there's a much higher God. And that's a God that's abundantly kind and can allow for anything to exist. That a person could do any sin in the world on earth and still repair it. That's the God that I choose to believe in. And that's the concept of tshuva. That you can look at another person and have mercy on them. That they might have grown up in very, very terrible circumstances. They might not even Torah mitzvot. But it doesn't matter. Their soul might be much higher than you. And we need to start accepting that and we need to start helping these people come back. That's why we need to start living this way. And that's why Shiva Pamim for Tzadik, because Tzadik will fall. And Tzadik will also get back up. And we need to learn how to get back up and continue to move. Bezat Hashem will give us the strength to do that. Mm -hmm. 
Any other thoughts or questions? No? Was that the Bible study? If you want to talk about it. Yeah, I really like that with the question, like that with the most reasonably. Like looking in looking at the good in others. Yes. Like that I feel like every time I come to a class you say exactly what I mean to hear because mm-hmm. I was thinking that today on Shabbat. It's like I should find the good in each person, even when it seems like really hard. Because everybody's good and you you have to find the good. Because then you find the good within yourself. But it's interesting how you said if you see bad in somebody else, it's like a reflection of yourself. Yeah. It's a concept in Hasidut, the Baal Shem Tov talks about it. Because... If you see somebody bad in someone else, like you're saying, you have that within you. Yeah. I, so, it was something that I really struggled to understand. The way I, under, I understand it is as follows. That things that... The way we understand things and the way that we engage in things in this world are based on the, the concepts of the knowledge that we have in our head. So the reason why I, for example, know how to open up a book and read is because I've learned English and I know that I'm gonna start here and I'm gonna work down and I'm gonna read this way, but if I'm reading Hebrew, I'm gonna go this way and I know how to translate. So those experiences allow me to be able to understand something. Same thing for the way that I have action, same way that, and it gets much more sophisticated, it goes into character, emotions, the way that you're brought up with your family, your friends, right? This gets very psychological. Now, we get, thrown with a package of different types of experiences. Right now, we're all in a room and we're all you know, young people, but we have a tremendous amount of life experience. You know, Even a person that's even 15 years old, think about, or a person that's 10 years old, think about all the experiences that they've gone through, thousands and millions of different thoughts. Every single day, right? there's a Harvard study that came out that said a person does anywhere between 50 to 150,000 thoughts per day, right? So, and we're 99% on autopilot during the day. That's why Hibo Didut is so beautiful because you stop and you say, I'm gonna be conscious now and I'm gonna speak to Hashem. So that's why meditation is also very important. That's why Goyim have turned on so much to, to meditation. Mm-hmm. And meditation essentially is a gift that Avram Avinu gave to the East. Mm-hmm. So it comes from the Midrash that Avram actually passed on to the East. That's why meditation is so big in the East because it essentially roots from Avram. But Judaism has meditation in it since the beginning of time. And I'm sorry I got a little bit sidetracked, right? But the reason why I brought this up with good and bad is because our experiences allow us to engage. Now, if I have in me, like let's say you think of a cup, right? And, and you're thinking about a mixture of a cup and you think that there's water in it. And let's say there's one drop of poison in it. Could it still kill you? Technically, yes, right? But the thing is that we have a tremendous amount of dilution in our body. Stop thinking about a let's shift away from the poison now and let's shift about sifting out good and bad. Now, if my cup is filled with 50% good, 50% bad, I have 50% of bad to get away from. But the, pro- but the thing about it is that because I have those 50% of bad, those experiences of the bad that exist within me, within my mind, within my actions, within my emotions, with the way I speak, with the things I've learned, they're going to influence the way that I engage outwardly in the things that happen to me in this world. Exactly. So if I have a problem, for example, that I have anger, the experiences that are going to test me in my life, that let's say I need to repair anger, because many people need to repair anger, until I repair that negative part of anger within myself, I'm never going to be able to not only correct that, but then also I'm going to see anger in other people. But if I remove anger from myself, I will create an experience in a space where there will not be anger entering and also going out. Meaning that people will not get angry at me and I will not get angry outward. To the point that it affects how people will interact with you. And so that's why I say that if I'm seeing bad things, it's because there's bad things still within myself. And everybody has bad, and I'm not just bashing myself aside from the fact that it's important to recognize those things, but everybody needs to recognize those things that they need to work on themselves. So it's another aspect of Ibu to sit there and to meditate and to think about, you know, and to converse with God about, hey, I'm really struggling with this, for example. I, I curse a lot. I say a lot of bad words. Can you please help me remove that? As a good segula, by the way, to work on your breed, the sexual part of the breed, because there's two types of breeds. There's the breed of the mouth and there's the breed of the esot, which is the male or female sexual organ. Watching the way that you speak will help affect... Um, your breeds of the sexual part as well. 
And it's remarkable, Kabbalistically, and I was sharing this with a couple people that I was walking with on Friday night, that the more and more I worked on myself to speak well, but not just not to curse, to only say good things, or to pay attention to the way that I speak, or to select my words properly, or to choose how I'm going to speak, or maybe I don't need to speak right now, maybe I let someone else speak. That, um, just the correction of my mouth, allowed for me to have a, a stronger facility in being able to correct also my breeds that's a sexual, that's the sexual organ of the, of, the, of the body part. And part of that I think Kabbalistically connects to the fact that speech is directly connected to your thoughts and what you see, and correcting that as well helps, which we learn from the Shema. But also we know that the seed of the Brit, Kabbalistically, also comes from the drops of the mind. Rabbi Nachman has a lesson on this as well, and it's talked about in the Zohar and the Arizal. And the beauty of it is that repairing the mind and repairing the way you think so that you speak carefully is showing a consciousness of being attention to not only what's being digested and, and working in your mind, to the point that it also corrects the way your physical actions are and the urges of your physical body. So that's where it kind of connects with all those things about making sure that you only have good things within yourself and therefore you will only experience good things. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Once you change it, you change it. Rashid Chochmah, Da'at, exactly. So Da'at is very important to understanding the combination of Chochmah and Bina. It's, it's, very, it's very, very important. All right, well, um, it was a pleasure, everyone. <laughs>